Good morning, everybody. I, my, my name is Roberto Russo, and uh, I come from the Maastricht University Medical Center. I will present you a few clues regarding the use of ECMO as temporary support for cardiogenic shock. These are my uh, this is my disclosure, my conflict of interest. So, just to give you a few a few clues, how the temporary support uh, devices are used in the cardiogenic shock. This is a recent paper still in press regarding the use of such devices in US and the comparison between the peripheral VAD versus intraortic balloon pump. And you can see here that the, the blue line is the mortality along the last, let's say, 10 years from 2008 to 2017. And you can appreciate that there is no major difference. Uh, instead, the uh, amount of admissions is, uh, is steadily increasing. But what about the type of devices used? And you can see from this uh, uh, survey with this study, which uh, uh, evaluated more than 1 million admissions for acute cardiogenic shock in the US, that the use of ECMO was, uh, was uh, uh, only 1.3% of the total cases. And you can clearly appreciate that intraortic balloon pump is steadily and I would say uh, impressively declining, whereas the use of peripheral devices is actually gradually increasing, but still very much underutilized, 1.3% echo and almost 2% the peripheral VAD like impeller or so forth. But what about the use of ECMO in acute cardiogenic shock? These are the table and the figures from the ELSO registry, the extracorporeal life support organization, and you can clearly appreciate the really the booming of the use of ECMO for uh, acute uh, cardiac uh, uh, diseases. But there are a few aspects that I would like to talk uh, uh, with, uh, to you this morning. And the, this is the timing of the application of ECMO, the organization, this is a really critical issue, the configuration and approach, because the way you use ECMO could be really important and critical, and the way you manage, and particularly uh, the eleven trickle unloading, the transition to a more advanced devices, and the new indication. I will not discuss in depth all these aspects, but I will give you some clues for some of them. But most importantly, I will say, is the kind of uh, problems we are uh, facing now, particularly complication, and after all, unfortunately, still the lack of uh, clear evidences. So what about the timing? This is a, a paper from the group from China who showed that uh, unfortunately, the way uh, the uh, ECMO, uh, let's say, affected the patient uh, uh, hemodynamics and therefore the uh, uh, acidosis is really critical. And uh, uh, the way the uh, lactates are washed out after ECMO uh, implantation is very important. But I will say not only that, it's also that if you implant ECMO with a, a high lactate at the beginning, the chances of recovery are certainly lower then uh, patient receiving ECMO still not in a very compromised and sometimes uh, irreversible situation. And just to give you an idea, this is another paper who showed that the time from diagnosis of acute, in this case, acute right failure to implant of ECMO really made a big difference. And you can see here that in this part, in the left bar, the survivors, the time from diagnosis to implantation of the ECMO for the assist device was really short, whereas in the non survivor this time was absolutely much longer. So again, the timing, so the early, the better for sure in this kind of situation. But what about the configuration? We know that the, the original configuration of ECMO was a cannula to draw, uh, to drain the venous blood and the cannula to uh, uh, re-infuse the uh, oxygenated blood in the arterial system. But now this is situation changed. You can see from this paper that uh, we uh, published a few, uh, a couple of years ago, that the situation now is becoming much more complex. And we are using now very different kind of configuration modes. I don't want you to go through all these uh, uh, modes and configuration, but just to give you an idea, that really this, the way we are using ECMO now is very much different from the original configuration. And you have to take into consideration these things. So patient tailored uh, ECMO configuration is very important now. And the, this kind of configuration more complex than only two canals is now called hybrid uh, ECMO. 
And the hybrid ECMO does not include only the, the addition and the adjunct of new cannulas to achieve maybe a, a, a better hemodynamically tailored support, but also the use of associated device like ECMO like ECMO and balloon pump or ECMO and impeller. And why so? Because the combination of the two devices, it seems that can give a much better support. But not only that, we now have now uh, some different kind of support with approaching uh, something that in the past was really uh, thought really unfeasible. Now we are approaching the pulmonary artery through a percutaneous approach. And this really makes the thing even much easier to uh, support the patient in acute cardiogenic shock, sometimes only right ventricular support. You can see here we achieve the pulmonary artery through the, the uh, internal jugular vein and the cannula through guide wire can reach with the, of course, careful implantation, the pulmonary artery. You can see the guide wire in the pulmonary artery. And then the cannula can start, of course, uh, bypassing the right ventricle and uh, perfusing on the pulmonary artery. This is a a new approach, a very promising, and used either to drain uh, blood from the pulmonary artery or to perfuse. But what about the organization? This is a paper published in 2018 from the, uh, from the Detroit group, and they look at uh, two situations. The one before the organization of the shock team of the so-called ECMO team and after. And you can see here on the left, the survival to explant in the Detroit area before the organization of the dedicated team was 51%. But look how much better uh, it was after the organization and the reorganization, the re-engineering of the team. 85% survival to explant and 75% survival to discharge. So this means that the dedicated team uh, really putting the, the, the patient in a, in a careful a decision-making process can really make a big difference. What about the manager and load, particularly left ventricular loading on ECMO? I, I mentioned before that the hybrid approach now con consists also of a, a, a adding a new device like intraortic balloon pump, or this is IBAC, or the impella to, uh, uh, to make the, the, the ECMO more beneficial, particularly avoiding left ventricular distension and stasis. This is a paper published in 2017 by Papalardo uh, Milan Group and also uh, Westerman from Hamburg. And they look at two groups of pa uh, patients, ECMO plus Impella or ECMO alone. And you can see that the mortality was much higher in the ECMO alone group with a, a very good uh, uh, results with the combination of the devices, either as a overall survival, but also as a winning and also to transition to mechanical circuitry support. And of course, there was a little bit of more complication like hemolysis in the ECMO plus Impella. But we have now a new paper looking with a systematic review and meta-analysis about the strategy, what kind of uh, device and about the timing of left ventricular venting. You can see from this meta-analysis, which uh, uh, examine almost 8,000 patients with 62 exceptional studies, and they show clearly the left ventricular venting on ECMO enhance the winning, but particularly improve the short-term survival. And the earlier this uh, venting was uh, was applied, the better, and also this improved the short-term survival. Of course, the the the, the use of vent venting increased a little bit the time on ECMO and the the ICU length of stay. But still, the nice results about the early uh, uh, um, survival, the early uh, outcome is really clear. So venting is going to be, I, I believe, more and more used in this respect. And also, the, the, the application of ECMO now is increasingly applied in other areas which were thought to be not really a contraindication, but certainly not uh, uh, easily or not uh, uh, not frequently and commonly uh, applied, like the use of ECMO in, uh, in uh, acute massive pulmonary embolism. This is a, a very recent paper from the group of Baltimore and New York, and they look at the use of ECMO in this kind of patients. But uh, you could see here 45 patients, but at the end only 41 were, were uh, considered, and 11, they required ECMO, but also embolectomy, and 30 patients, so more than 70%, they just needed ECMO and the uh, pulmonary embolism 
solved without any surgical embolism and you can uh, embolectomy you can see here in the in the group that require embolectomy so ECMO plus surgical embolectomy the survivor was astonished astonishing 100 percent whereas in the group in which only ECMO was used because the anticoagulation of ECMO uh, was able to solve the the uh, embolism this 90 day survival was 97 percent this was also part of the decision why the, the European Society of Cardiology included ECMO now in the management of acute pulmonary embolism. So this is to be considered now, I think, a very nice tool in this kind of patient affected by acute pulmonary embolism. Another very, unfortunately, uh, let's say downside of the problem is a complication. We know that complications are really the Achilles heel in, uh, in uh, uh, cardiogenic shock uh, treated by ECMO because ECMO is a aggressive, uh, it's aggressive uh, uh, I mean, treatment and so therefore complications are really, uh, really frequent and common. And you see here in this review, we look at the complication along the years and there'll be just, there were a little, a little bit of reduction in some, in some of these complications that camera problems, surgical site hemorrhage, and also clinical seizure, but the majority of this complication didn't reduce along the time. So this is really a very, very important uh, uh, clue, a very important field for in the further investigation and improvement. We look at the limb ischemia, which is really a, na a very, very nasty and very bad complication in the in peripheral particular venal arterial ECMO. And we look at these uh, uh, at the uh, rates in 28 studies with almost 3,000 patients examined. You can see the limb ischemia went from zero to 46 percent and the mean of 16 percent. But new uh, new devices like this new cannula maybe will reduce the rate of uh, limb ischemia in peripheral ECMO. So to find and to finalize scientific evidence, I think unfortunately we have still very few evidences that ECMO is really affecting acute cardiogenic shock. And you can see from clinical trial gone that a lot of studies are ongoing and uh, hopefully they will give some replies in a short time. So in conclusion, I think that we could say that ECMO as a temporary support is certainly increasingly applied, but unfortunately still underutilized. There are still some caveats for sure, like timing, configuration, LV and loading, organization, the new expanded indication and transition. But there are also some uh, field of improvement for like patient selection, complication, management technology, but shock team is critical. And I think the new studies and the ongoing trial will give us some new evidences. Thank you very much.